Do you agree? So, the judge did look at the evidence. I said, look, I'm not paying your licence under Section 15, Article 3 of the Terrorism Act. Um, and they went through the procedure. I got the court summons, uh, went to court. They asked me if I was guilty. I said, no, I'm not guilty of having an appropriate licence because the licence isn't appropriate because I'll be funding terrorism because I know the BBC has covered up the true events of the day. And eventually we arrive here today and um, the result has been, um, I have to say a fair judge in my opinion, um, that I have not been convicted. Uh, I have no fine. Uh, court costs £200, which you guys have very generously donated to. Um, and I have to behave myself and get a TV licence, of course, which I'll be running down the post office tomorrow to buy. <coughs> Um, but hopefully we've set a little a little precedent here where we might encourage people to go and do the same thing and uh, you know go to their police, tell them about today, um, give them the evidence. Uh, West Sussex Police have said they're investigating it, which they're obliged to do because the BBC had prior knowledge of a terrorist event, which under I think it's Section 38 of the Terrorism Act uh, they should have reported, which they didn't, and they've since given this. Uh, since given us this impossible flannel about World Trade Center 7 collapsing due to an office fire, which uh, even in the NIST report says uh, fell at free fall speed for eight floors in, in 2.5 seconds. Now that is absolutely impossible without a controlled demolition being involved. Absolutely impossible. There's no arguments around it. Don't let anyone else tell you otherwise because they're saying Isaac Newton is wrong. Why did he do it for the TV licence with BBC? Because primarily Jane Stanley um, in 9-11 from the BBC reported 23 minutes before World Trade Centre Building 7 collapsed that it had actually fallen. So that indicated some prior knowledge um, of, uh, that the BBC had in terms of the events of 9-11. Um, and we've never had a satisfactory explanation from the BBC as to how they had that prior knowledge and made the mistake of announcing the fall of the tower before it actually hit. Uh, I'm Peter Durham, representing, representing architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth as the UK facilitator. Uh, today um, I was going to give evidence um, as part of the, myself and two other individuals uh, back in 2011 um, uh, lodged some official complaints with the BBC about two of the documentaries that they showed in 2011 as part of the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Of um, and the BBC, um, as Ian Henshaw has just described, they have very strict uh, requirements uh, through their Royal Charter and their agreement and their editorial guidelines where they have to present information um, that is impartial and accurate and they are required to correct any mistakes that they make. Um, and one of the very important pieces of, of evidence that we were going to present today was um, in 2007, the BBC, in one of their documentaries, um, suggested that uh, Building 7 did not come down at free fall speed um, and said that the scientists and the architects who were suggesting that it had come down at free fall speed were wrong. Uh, but then in 2008, uh, we had the official investigators who came out and actually then said, well, no, Building 7 did come down at free fall speed. Uh, which is a huge uh, statement to make because we know that it can only come down at free fall speed through controlled demolition. Uh, so the BBC had make, made a very, very big uh, mistake in 2007 uh, by saying that, that free fall had not occurred. The BBC was incompetent, verging on dishonest. Oh, let's rephrase that, dishonest. Uh, I was the leading author on 9-11 when they did their conspiracy files programs. I never had a phone call from them. Now, you know, they might have disagreed with me, they might have uh, disliked me, but as they're paid by the public to investigate impartially and give a full account of what happens. And if they're doing a film about so-called conspiracy theories, then that obliges them to talk to anybody who's, you know, in the position I was. I'd been serialised in the Daily Mail. Instead, they got some guys from America who had some pretty cookie ideas and presented them to the public as the face of 9-11 investigators who they call conspiracy theorists. Um, you've published two books on 9-11, is that right? Yeah, 9-11 Revealed, which was serialised in the Daily Mail and sold tens of thousands of copies, and 9-11 The New Evidence, which is the update on that book, which was a very detailed look into the paper trail, particularly of the 9-11 attacks and the role of the FBI and the CIA in facilitating the 9-11 attacks. Um, 
And yet the BBC had no interest in talking to you? They had no interest in talking to me. They didn't even phone me up. They didn't email me. Even the people who made one of the propaganda films, Flight 93, they spent three hours talking to me. They didn't take a blind bit of notice of anything I said, but they did go to the trouble of phoning and talking. The BBC had a lot of resources. Uh, they don't want to know. Uh, they, they were grossly dishonest in their investigations of the 9-11 attacks and that was, that's what I was here to say to the court today. Unfortunately, the court uh, today, the judge didn't let us demonstrate all the evidence. We had some very good witnesses, Tony Farrell, uh, former intelligence officer for South Yorkshire Police, Niels Harrett, eminent scientist from Copenhagen, uh, Ray Savage, former counter-terrorism officer, uh, who else am I living out? Peter Drew, wonderful chap, coordinated the uh, campaign against the BBC, trying to find out about Building 7, which they refused to talk about. Um, Adrian Mallet, former firefighter, engineer. I had a good load of witnesses lined up, but we weren't allowed to present them. That said, the judge has seen the evidence, he said he's seen the evidence, so we now know that, that for a fact that one judge in this country is very, uh, very aware of what happened on 9-11, and I wasn't, I have no conviction. Do you I have, have no the judge's conviction. name, please? Uh, judge Stephen Nichols, I believe. Oh. Do you know him? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> no, a, a nice chap, it has to be said. It has to be said. Yes. And um, towards the end of the case, for anyone who wasn't in the, in the room, I did kick off a little bit because, I mean, it does come down to a question of morality. Do you keep funding these bloody paedophile rings at the BBC? Yeah. I know this is... It's a sub judice, but I think it's been fairly well established that what's going on. Um, and do we fund an organisation that tells us the impossible, that Building 7 fell because of an office fire? It's utter crap. And we should stop paying them, go to your police station, go to your lawyer, wherever you have to go. I wouldn't bother petitioning your MPs, they're a complete shower of shit in my opinion. Um, but go to the police, tell them... Um, Sussex Police has said it's with divisional intelligence. We'll get it to other divisional intelligences as well, wherever, wherever you live. Get them there and um, do your best, you know, because it's not an imprisonable offence, TV licensing. Um, and I got the lowest possible punishment today. I didn't get convicted. Um, the judge took the stuff seriously, and so he should, because you can't get any more serious than Isaac Newton. And, it, you know, it's an immutable law of science, and the BBC have been lying, and if they, if, they, if, if they want to take me to court for saying that they're liars, fine, we'll go back. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down.